It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Brad Carter. Uh, he is the professor of physics and director of the Center of Astrophysics at the University of uh, Southern Australia, uh, Queensland. Um, and uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to welcome him today. So he has contributed to the discovery of over 40 planets orbiting stars other than the sun and has also led to the development of uh, Mount Ken Observatory into an astronomical and space science facility. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Carter to this uh, colloquium. And uh, so let's hear about what he has to say about uh, exoplanets, which we are all very excited to hear. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and hello everyone online. Um, these are, of course, um, perhaps not quite as uh, dynamic as a in, an in-person lecture, but I'll do my best to uh, share some of my enthusiasm for exoplanets and the relationship between stars and planets. So uh, I work at the University of Southern Queensland here in Australia, and hopefully you can you can understand what I'm saying despite my accent. So um, I thought I'd begin this afternoon with a, a little bit of a prelude um, to take us back uh, uh, back a step. And I would argue that you could sort of um, think of modern astronomy as uh, facing four grand questions or four grand challenges. And the first is the profound question, of course, why are we here? And from a physics point of view, that's about why our physical universe exists with the laws of physics as it is today. Um, the second question, of course, how did we get here? So there's various ev evolutions going on in the cosmos as a whole, uh, galactic evolution, stellar evolution, and of course, planetary evolution, uh, including our own very own planet Earth. Um, the third question, of course, uh, what's our future? So uh, science is, of course, a fantastic way not only to understand where we are, who we are, to some extent, how we got here, but also forecasting changes at an, ast in an astronomical level, we can predict the future of the sun and the future of the Earth and the universe as a whole. So uh, a certain amount of forecasting, thanks to science. And of course, the fourth question, which fascinates many, including yours truly, is who's out there? In other words, there's a search, a grand search led by NASA and other organizations, uh, a quest for habitable worlds, uh, inhabited places, and of course, ultimately, where there are thinking beings out there amongst the stars. So uh, mostly this afternoon, I'll be talking about the pathway to addressing this final question of who's out there. So I'm going to begin today by talking about um, what has been described by David Chiardi and others, um, astronomer at, uh, at Nexi in California, know the star, know the planet. Um, the, the science of why it's important to understand stars, to understand their planetary systems. Um, in terms of uh, what we do at the University of Southern Queensland, USQ here in Queensland, Australia, uh, we have a small number of key projects and I'll talk about them. Um, one of them, of course, is very much in, involves the University of Louisville, uh, Minerva Australis and Shared Skies. Both um, are very much a wonderful collaboration between U of L and USQ and others. Uh, we'll talk briefly about stellar seismology, uh, the so-called SONG project, which USQ is now a part of, and how that can help with understanding not just stars, but their planets. Then we'll move on to uh, exoplanet research um, that can be done with um, something called the Galar Galactic Archaeology Survey. And for those unfamiliar with the term, a Galar is also an Australian bird. Um, finally, yeah, under the key projects, I'll mention uh, the Be Cool Stellar Magnetic Field Studies of stars and by implication, um, the space weather that's generated by host stars for their planetary systems. And then I'll talk about uh, stellar and exoplanet uh, research we'll do with the Veloce spectrograph that is now at the at Siding Spring and an auxiliary telescope called Raptor. Uh, I'll talk about the, the future of USQ research being involved in something called the Twinkle Space Mission. It's a cute name, but a very serious spacecraft that will do exoplanet survey work in the future. And then a little bit of commentary on the implications of exoplanetary research for finding life in the universe. So David Chiardi, I think um, in one paragraph here, um, really encapsulates the scientific philosophy, the motivation for a lot of us doing 
research in uh, stars and exoplanetary research. We're now entering this era of really trying to understand the structure and composition of planets. Okay, so it's the what planets exist, uh, how they form. Uh, the star, of course, just like in our solar system, is the dominant part of the system. The sun dominates the solar system in terms of energy and mass and all sorts of other things. Um, and so in the same way, it's crucial for us to understand stars and their planetary systems holistically with a, a great understanding of the star itself. So in other words, know the star to know the planet. So let's start out from our home world, which is the solar system. And uh, the sun is at least a second generation Milky Way star. And of course, formed from a, a, a disk of, of uh, gas with some dust, a dusty gas uh, that formed, of course, uh, terrestrials as well as uh, Jovians and all sorts of other things. We have eight major planets, of course, and the compositions we know all too well, rock and ice and dust. And of course, um, the sun continues to influence uh, planet Earth, not through just gravity and radiation, but solar winds and space weather, magnetic fields uh, that constantly bathes the, the solar system. Um, the, the sun, of course, was um, a very rapid rotator when it began uh, its life. It was uh, therefore a very magnetically active star. And of course, we see today many, many examples of young suns, just like the sun when it was young. So we can, by proxy, understand the early activity of the sun. It's incredible um, influence uh, on, on the solar system through uh, activity by looking at young stars. Uh, we do, of course, live in a, a rather long, I'm pleased to say, but finite period of relatively benign sun. It might be a billion years from now before we start to see changes in the sun that will really affect the climate on the Earth, no matter what we do. And uh, eventually, uh, sadly, um, the sun will cause a runaway greenhouse effect on Earth. It's at least a billion years away. Um, so please don't get too worried this afternoon. I hope you enjoy your weekend. Don't worry and dwell too much on this. But yes, we live in a finite period of habitability for planet Earth, of course. Habitability is both a time and a place. So um, planets, of course, uh, we have seen um, the solar system being all that was known about until the 90s. Um, and um, May Michelle Mayer and Didier Kiel's, uh, of course, quite rightly won a Nobel Prize for their extraordinary work um, and uh, just beginning this extraordinary journey we're still on, finding huge numbers of planets around stars other than the sun. So exoplanets or extrasolar planets really denotes those orbiting other stars, but we can also talk about rogue planets, interstellar planets, which we, as far as we can tell, all began uh, in orbit around the host star before they were let loose. So we talk about planets in a general sense, whether it's an exoplanet or a solar system planet. And uh, just to where necessary, we can make the distinction, of course, by using the exoplanet tag. Uh, the tally of planet continues to rise. And so I haven't checked today's tally, but it tends to rise, you know, on a weekly basis at least. At least. And large numbers of multi-planet systems, just like our solar system, are, of course, now well known. The stars and planets, of course, have a shared history. Um, the sun, um, of course, um, is a magnetic star. Um, and um, the magnetized gas, the fossil fields are given way to a dynamo field, which dominates today. Um, and of course, stellar evolution depends critically on the mass of the star. So our sun's fate is to a large extent determined by its mass, though to, to a smaller extent by the metals and anything other than hydrogen and helium and the angular momentum it's governing its rotation rate and hence activity. Um, a planetary evolution there in, in a sense is hostage to what this, this host star is doing. So planetary evolution depends on many factors, obviously, including to a large extent what the host star is doing. So, of course, we have billions of planets in a Carl Sagan like way we call, talk about billions and billions of planets uh, more than 100 billion worlds in the Milky Way alone are estimated to be out there um, hundreds of millions of potentially habitable worlds uh, in the Milky Way alone um, so uh, across the visible universe there are likely to be a staggering number of of exoplanets um, and 
huge numbers of Earth-like worlds uh, out there uh, beyond our own solar system. Um, so, um, and as the universe continues to evolve, we live in an age of stars preferentially forming planets. Um, um, and so over time, we will have perhaps ever more habitable worlds um, for an extended period of time. And again, some navel gazing we can do here, prognosticate on a, the fact that eventually even the last stars will run out of fuel, the red, last red dwarfs will die 100 trillion years, years from now, sadly. That's, that is, looks to be the fate. But again, uh, let's uh, cheer ourselves with the fact that it's a very long time away from now, something we perhaps we shouldn't concern ourselves with. Okay, so how do we find exoplanets? So let's look at uh, exoplanets 101 for a bit, the basic techniques involved. So um, one really effective and relatively simple technique is to watch as the planet that might be there happens to transit and temporarily dim the host star in the same way that we, we see Mercury and Venus transit our sun. Um, uh, exoplanets, of course, can produce a temporary but rather characteristic um, light curve um, with some characteristic dimming. And to some extent, we can get an idea of the system uh, of the planet and the star um, from the transit light curve. So the transits depend on the on the stellar and orbital inclinations and the radius of the planet. So we can get some, uh, you know, basic physics, if you like, uh, can come out of a, a, a light curve. The key thing in all of this is precision. And the reason people haven't found exoplanets um, a long time ago this way is it's incredibly precise photometry is required. Um, so, you know, 1% one, 1 precision is, is nowhere near good enough for a lot of worlds. You need one part in a thousand, one part in a million. So, uh, so precision is the breakthrough here that's given us a host of exoplanet discoveries from the transit technique. Uh, of course, the, the other very, very important uh, search technique to use to find and characterize exoplanets is the Doppler wobble, um, which is essentially watching the star move back and forth along our line of sight. Um, a radial velocity measurement, which is the stellar reflex motion. So as the star moves, um, it does a little dance, if you like, just like the sun it does a little motion from the orbits of all the planets around it. Um, that reflex motion of the star um, around the common centre of mass is, um, with the right precision, um, something that can give us uh, an idea of the, at least the mass estimate, a minimum planetary mass and the orbit of the planet. Um, so the tricky part for some of us, of course, is when you want to find a planet with this technique around an active star, because now with the level of precision in radial velocity, which is at the order of a metre per second, you start to pick up the activity of the star itself, especially with a young and active star. It's a real problem to try and se separate the reflex motion of the star from the intrinsic motion of the star's atmosphere and surface. Nevertheless, we are finding large numbers of planetary systems. There's an example plot there. Um, there are solar system-like worlds to some extent, but there is much more diversity than one would have expected if you'd picked up a 1990 textbook uh, that said anything about exoplanets. Our solar system is just one model, one architecture for the system um, amongst an incredibly diverse array of systems. Um, and of course, uh, we see things like orbital resonances. So the Titius Bode law is, is a real thing for exoplanetary systems, I suppose. Um, and gravitational interactions um, yeah, produce extraordinary complexity, um, I think, and migration, uh, even in our solar system. Um, planets get ejected, we get rogue interstellar worlds. So all sorts of crazy, uh, exciting things happen um, through the da gravitational dances of exoplanets as they are forming or after they're formed. Uh, one of the techniques to in fact confirm that you have found a genuine exoplanet is that the planets you find should be gravitational sta gravitationally stable on a period of min millions of years. Um, because uh, if you find a planet that dynamically looks like it's about to shift dramatically, then you, sus you might suspect your own results. So the worlds we find are uh, assumed to be relatively gravitationally stable. Okay, so we can sort of have a, um, a stamp collecting approach here, if you like, to exoplanets by categorizing exoplanets in terms of gas giants like Jupiter 
um, um, more Neptune-like um, worlds, uh, still uh, giant and gaseous. Uh, super Earths, which we don't find in our solar system, Earth-like, but rather heavier and bigger. Um, and more genuinely Earth-like worlds, terrestrials uh, that might be like Earth or Mars or Venus. So, so that's, that's one way to start categorizing what we do find in terms of the exoplanetary zoo. And of course, once we do get basic information from transit and radial velocity observations, the mass radius and density offer at least in a basic way into comparison. So comparative planetology is deprovincialized from the solar system to planetary systems uh, in general. So, of course, the, one of the themes of exoplanetary science today is the extraordinary diversity that is out there. Um, in the solar system, we were probably familiar with the concept of a snow line, where out, out of, uh, outward from the snow line, you have icy uh, ices available, um, and you can produce um, the, the gas giants, um, warm terrestrials, telluric, rocky worlds, um, that are warmer and closer to the host star than the snow line. But of course, um, when you actually look at real exoplanetary systems, it's a bit more complicated. Sure, we do get um, solar system like Jupiter analogs. So we do see to some extent that yes, there are sort of vaguely solar system like systems, which is perhaps reassuring. Um, but you get these extraordinary things like hot Jupiters, which are Jupiter worlds that have migrated close to the host star. Um, Neptune's doing the same trick. Uh, super Earths, which are seem to be rather more common than Earths like our own, um, and uh, really, really extended um, gas giants. So a hot Jupiter, sufficiently close and bloated, um, is so is so it's like sort of candy floss. The density is extraordinarily low, and these worlds are actually given their own name, Super Puffs. Sounds like a breakfast cereal, I know. Um, okay, so uh, we have also, also lots of examples of planets that are in tilted rotation, um, retrograde orbits. We have resonant or near resonant planetary systems, as I mentioned earlier, and of course, increasing number of rogue interstellar planets found out there. So what this all means, of course, is we have uh, we have diversity that uh, comes from um, planetary migration as these worlds are actually forming in the dusty gas disk, major gravitational interactions at all stages from formation through to formed planets. And uh, of course, um, we are probably missing a lot of the story because to some extent we're facing observational selection. We're finding the planets that are in a sense the easiest to find. And the ones we might be most interested in, which is genuine Earths and solar system exact analogs, are in some ways the hardest ones to look for, especially when you're looking for long period planets that you have to wait a long time to uh, to get a complete radial velocity curve, for example. So, so our exoplanet surface census is certainly quite um, incomplete, and we need to keep looking, folks. Um, of course, most people are fascinated by the habitable zone planets, the the the, uh, the Goldilocks worlds, um, and start for for. Uh, potentially benign habitable world starts with temperature. So we look for planets that tend to be um, not too cold, not too hot, just right um, in terms of the sort of the calculated but somewhat assumed temperature of the hypothetical atmosphere. Um, given we know very little about the planet itself, we, we sort of, we, these are just back of the envelope calculations, but they give us an idea that we, uh, we might have a potentially habitable world. Um, what I would argue, though, is that we have to add to that um, uh, many factors when we're really serious about assessing planetary habitability. And one of the things we particularly focus on at USQ is the role of space weather, winds, and activity on, uh, the, uh, on, on the planet. OK, here we go. Next slide. Um, so, uh, when we are assessing a planet, um, how it's evolving, and of course how habitable it may be, um, what we really want to do is understand the atmosphere. Okay, that gives us so much information. But of course, you thought it was hard to just find a planet. It's much harder to actually get a spectrum of the planetary atmosphere. So, so a lot of time and effort by NASA and other um, leading organisations around the world are all working on how you can understand spectroscopically what the planet atmosphere is doing. 
Um, transiting planets make good targets. Um, using different sin techniques, you can understand what the net spectrum of the planet might look like, depending whether the planet is visible or invisible. So you use a differencing technique, and what you find is things uh, like water vapor, carbon compounds. Um, you see for hot Jupiters, of course, worlds that are so close to the host star, their atmospheres are being irradiated, um, and um, the winds that probably um, are, pre are present as well from the host star are causing atmospheric es escape. So some of these worlds, uh, you've probably seen the artist's impression, look like gigantic comets because of the atmospheric ablation that is going on. But uh, but this is an area of research that's as yet in its infancy. Mostly we just get weak and noisy signals. We want the James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes to give us much higher quality data um, to be understand the basic physics of what's going on, the molecules that are present, temperature structures. Um, but this, you know, this work is taking off now. And there is, of course, a series of conferences running called ExoClimbs. So people are studying not just atmospherics, but also uh, exoplanetary climates. OK, moving right along. Um, once you know something about the atmospheres, and even when you don't, you can still make some uh, calculations around what lies underneath. Uh, again, very limited indirect data so, so far on exoplanets. Um, and, and so for the most part, it's modeling that does the um, the characterization. So we use the trusted laws of physics, uh, what limited data we have, we use what we understand from solar system. Um, we put this all together to try and work out what planets are made of and what their interior structures might be like. Um, and there are some um, models of Kepler discovered star uh, planets and you know, this is this is what we're doing. We can't be too sure, of course, but it's it's wonderful to see um, the world of science tackling the issue of of um, planetary characterization for a, for a world that is so incredibly distant. Uh, another technique we can use to understand exoplanets is, of course, a seismology of stars. So, um, as you may understand. Um, we can do astro seismology by looking at the radial velocity, the back, back and forth motion of, along the line of sight of the surface of the star. So there's very subtle um, motions of the sun. Um, the sun is ringing like a gong, and that's evident through oscillations that we see at the solar surface. In the same way, we can do that type of science for stars, both using photometry and spectroscopy. So the illustration there is about very precise uh, photometry which gives us some indication of a uh, oscillating stellar surface. And you can work out the, uh, the various acoustic waves and structure that is happening inside. Uh, spectroscopy is, is another really important way to understand what the stellar surfaces are doing in terms of motion and inferring what is happening in terms of the interior structure and the, the, the waves that are perpetually bouncing around inside the star. Um, I think it's quite extraordinary when it does work um, be, uh, because when you do get um, the right observations, the model gives you ex exquisitely detailed information about the star and exquisitely precise information about the basic physics of the star itself, which in turn means then you, once you've characterised the star precisely, you have a, actually a much better idea of the planet because, as you would imagine, uh, understanding the physical properties of the planet crucially depends on reference to the star. So again, know the star better and know the planet better. Uh, so it's again, technically very challenging, lots of uh, physics, lots of telescope time um, and precision is the key to all of this, but it is it is working and the field is, is slowly growing. Uh, okay, so we come to exoplanetary space weather. So in the solar system, we'd be familiar with the the fact that the sun produces not just a steady wind, but solar storms. There is a um, the magnetic fields. There is um, radiation. Um, the wind is is punctuated by these coronal mass ejections. Um, so, you know, we know that the solar system and the Earth is affected at some level by the sun's space weather. And early Mars was thought to have been significantly eroded in its atmosphere by the incredibly powerful young sun's wind. So, so space weather matters um, for exoplanets as well as our solar system. 
And what we do, of course, is we, we use the solar cell connection as a two-way street. Stars provide proxies for the sun, for its, its, its youth, its present day and its old age. Um, and of course, we can use um, solar physics, um, which is a, a very, very sophisticated, detailed work um, to infer what stellar physics is happening. So solar and stellar dynamos, of course, are all about um, producing magnetically energized activity. And uh, when the stars are young, that is when the greatest effect is occurring. And of course, if you are um, wanting to assess planetary habitability, um, uh, you don't want a, a planet that otherwise seemed benign, but is being er eroded like crazy in its atmosphere by a really powerful stellar wind. So we're back to this theme of know the star, know the planet. Um, we, uh, we are using stellar astronomy to do exoplanetary science. And uh, Paul Butler, who I happen to know a little bit at Carnegie, has always pro proclaimed himself not a, as a planet hunter, but as a stellar astro astronomer. He, he, his view is that we are really doing stellar astronomy, but in a new guise, so stellar astronomy to understand planets. Um, so, of course, stellar work has given us exoplanet discovery, uh, the mass and orbit information, the radius, the bulk density, the type of planet we get. Um, we uh, understand the atmosphere from, from spectroscopy. That's the difference in between the spectrum of the star alone and the spectrum of the star when the planet is visible. Um, so, you know, we put everything together, including uh, seismology of the host star um, and our studies of space weather to really um, take comparative planetology from just a solar system uh, technique into a new field where we essentially have comparative exoplanetology. And of course, this is all very relevant to looking for biosignatures, looking for those habitable worlds out there somewhere. Okay, um, just a brief pause for a moment, because um, there's a lot of slides we've gone through, um, but we're getting there. Uh, a little bit about USQ at this point, because we fit in um, to this, this story of uh, stellar and exoplanetary science. Um, astronomy at the University of Southern Queensland has been part of our story for some decades. We have a group and now a Centre for Astrophysics, so I apologise, we can't spell centre properly. We Australians seem to mix up where the R's and the E's are and the U's, too many U's go into words like colour. So if you can get past the strange English here, um, hopefully the slide makes some sense. Um, we're doing reasonably well in terms of research performance um, and we are part of Australia's um, Anglo-Australian Telescope Consortium running the 4 metre telescope. And as I mentioned before, we, we're involved with two projects at Siding Spring, Veloce and Veloce Rapida, Raptor and Galar. Uh, we have our own observatory at Mount Kent and thanks to John Kilcoff, the University of Louisville and the wonderful Shared Skies Partnership, uh, we have uh, wonderful facilities uh, similar to those at Moore Observatory in Kentucky and a genuine uh, sort of bilateral um, two hemisphere, two longitude zone observatory uh, in combination with Moore Observatory. Um, the site has been developed over the past few decades and I would argue um, in Queensland, um, it provides essentially the state observatory, um, which uh, complements uh, the optical observatory at Siding Spring. Uh, various campus photos there. And yes, I guess the middle picture here is the one that you might be most interested in. That's the Southern Sky Star Trail with the Magellanic Cloud. So we're very lucky at Mount Kent to have the wonderful views of the Southern Hemisphere sky. Our Centre for Astrophysics is part of an Institute for Advanced Engineering and Space Sciences. So we do stellar and planetary research. Uh, a research training is an important part of the story at Mount Kent Observatory outside a place called Toowoomba, which yes, is an indigenous name, uh, something to do with a swamp or something. Although um, Mount Kent is nowhere near any swamp. It's a nice dry site. Um, uh, we do uh, computational work allied with the, um, the work we do at Mount Kent Observatory and more recently increasing focus on um, translation of astronomical research uh, for space uh, purposes. Australia has finally got itself a space agency, finally reviving its space efforts and USQ is a small part of that story 
and I'm pleased to say as part of a Fulbright visit next year, I'll be in Kentucky working with John and others on translation of astronomy into more uh, space related um, applications. Uh, okay, won't spend too much time on this slide, um, but essentially our research themes at USQ are about stars and planets, exoplanets and stars and their magnetism and then combining the, the uh, studies so we can use studies of stellar activity to remove them, if you like, as pesky noise when finding exoplanets, um, understanding how stellar space weather affects exoplanetary evolution, um, and of course, to some extent, informing the grand quest uh, worldwide search for habitable worlds. Uh, and and we, uh, we provide to some extent a ground station um, helping out with the, the, the NASA test mission and hopefully future missions. And I mentioned Mount Kent Observatory, but I'll talk more in a moment. Um, okay, so key projects, uh, no need to worry about too many details here. The important thing is just to note that we have about 10 or so um, key projects. At top of the list is Shared Skies Partnership with the University of Louisville. And uh, UofL is also a key part of the Minerva Australis Consortium that is helping um, NASA find planets. And there was, in fact, a very recent this uh, press release in the last few days, uh, media release about a uh, planet found using Mount Kent data that is in, a, in an extremely eccentric orbit, um, an eccentricity of 0.8, which is basically crazy because um, most planets in our solar system are almost circular orbits. Uh, the SONGS uh, Astro Seismology Project I mentioned previously, um, a little bit of space work in that we are helping the German Space Agency find space debris. So we have a space debris camera telescope at Mount Kent. It's called SmartNet Instrument. Um, we're also part of a an Australian and a global network of small cameras that are looking for very bright meteor meteors to, to collect meteorite samples. And that's that's the global fireball observatory that we're part of. Veloce is about spectroscopy, radio velocity, Doppler wobble survey, Veloce Raptor. Um, adds to that. Uh, it adds to that work. I'll talk more about that shortly. Galar is about uh, a giant stellar survey, Milky Way stars in the, from the southern hemisphere, doing um, galactic archaeology, the study of old stars and stellar evolution throughout the history of the galaxy. Uh, Be Cool is about stellar magnetic fields of cool stars, hence the name Be Cool. Uh, the logo cost five euros and is a happy sun if you ever see it. Um, Twinkle Space Mission is, of course, the future. It's about doing exoplanet spectroscopy. So there's an overview of the stuff um, that we do. Um, and I will move on a little bit more detail to give you some background. So where is Mount Kent Observatory? Well, hopefully you know exactly where Australia is. And in Australia, on the right-hand side, in the East Coast, is the city of Brisbane, which I'm pleased to say is probably, like Brisbane, California, the only place in the world actually named after an astronomer. So Thomas McDougall Brisbane was a colonial governor of, of Australia, uh, but his real passion was astronomy. And there is the Brisbane catalogue of southern stars, you can see if you ever visit the Brisbane Planetarium. So the city of Brisbane has a connection with astronomy going way back, uh, thanks to the name. Now, Kent Observatory is a few hours drive inland from, from uh, Brisbane. And uh, in the south, but not too far, uh, and of course, it's focused on remote access and robotic astronomy. So we can see the south, we are in the eastern longitude like Japan, uh, relatively dark skies um, and communications is good enough to do our science. Um, if anyone's familiar with Siding Spring, uh, we're not quite as high as Siding Spring Mountain, uh, but it is less windy and that's actually, yeah, that's nice. Um, our saying is, not nowhere near as good as the best sites in Chile or Hawaii or those sort of places. But um, across the Australian continent, there is really no high, dry mountains on the west coast um, that would provide those ideal seeing conditions. So in Australia, you're probably a few billion years too late to have anything in the way of high mountains in the west coast. Uh, Australia is a very old, eroded part of the Earth's crust. So we have to put up with less than perfect astronomical seeing, but never mind. Um, anyway, yeah, so mostly um, it's a it's a decent uh, place for us to do astronomy. We're happy enough with it. And uh, 
shared skies, telescopes are on site, the Nova Australis, not rather than Australia, but the typo, just found it. Um, Song Stellar Seismology Telescopes, um, collaboration with the Danes on Song and also with an education telescope, um, SmartNet for the German Space Agency Space Debris Work. So everything is collaborative. We in many ways represent a southern eastern node for, for the world that finds it useful to have some telescopes on site. And what you see there is a, um, a new building we built there surrounded by a lot of telescope pads. Those telescope pads, there's about a dozen and they've mostly been filled now by an array of telescopes. Um, so we, 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 we quite literally have a telescope farm at Mount Kent Observatory, We're growing photons perhaps. Um, okay, Shared Skies Partnership. Um, delighted to be working with John Kilcoff for a long time now, since 2004 in fact, I think there was the first piece of paper that looked official, long-standing collaboration, live remote observing, um, and at Mount Kent, we have U of L's um, telescopes on site um, and similar telescopes at Moore uh, and uh, there's a telescope, of course, at Mount Lemmon that most of you would probably know about. Um, so we, we sort of like a mini Gemini, we get all of the night sky, north and south, and we get east and west longitudes as well. Um, in recent years, there's a lot of focus on planet work, um, the KELP project, the kilo degree, extremely little telescope, if you need to know. Uh, Kelts, uh, we've been part of Kelt finding planets, but this work has really moved now to NASA support, and there have been a few highlights in terms of planet discoveries, thanks to Mount Kent. So Minerva Australis is, uh, is perhaps the most um, ambitious, if you like, of the projects on site. Um, and yes, it's an acronym like oh, just about everything else in astronomy. Um, so Minerva Australis is supporting the test mission with ground-based radial velocity follow-up follow and exoplanet characterization. Um, and uh, it is somewhat special in being um, a dedicated exoplanet facility and as a southern counterpart to Minerva um, in Arizona at Mount Hopkins. Uh, there's a bunch of robotic CDK telescopes from plane wave instruments, and it's a partnership of Australian and US universities. Um, so, um, yeah, all good to see. Um, funded by various organisations, the Australian Research Council is the Australian version of the National Science Foundation, I guess, um, and we even have some NASA funding through Caltech and JPL, so that the US community, including you good people, can apply for time um, on um, to use Minerva Australis to do your research. So moving right along, I won't spend too much time in this because time is starting to get away from us. Um, Minerva Australis is all about supporting the TESS mission, as you again would be aware. TESS is the successor to Kepler, um, surveying hundreds of thousands of stars. Uh, the nearby ones, the brighter ones than Kepler, but it's an all-sky survey, uh, which makes it very different. And so TESS is finding planets that are much more amenable to detailed follow-up study. And of course, in doing the whole sky means Mount Kent Observatory in the south, as well as facilities in the north, can do a, a lot of good work uh, on exoplanet discovery and characterization and all sorts of follow up work. Um, so, the story here is, of course, um, tests and other instruments um, uh, finding large numbers of planets, but you need to do a lot more work to understand these worlds. Um, so, determining masses for transiting planets. Um, you, you even want to monitor where there is a known planet, the host stars, because you may well find there are additional planets in the system. So this this theme of understanding exoplanetary architectures by using whatever techniques available to find not just one planet, but as many planets as you can in the system. So ultimately, we're understanding planetary masses, densities and properties and planetary system architectures. Um, instrumentation, yes, there's a happy Rob Wittenmeyer who hails from Texas originally and is currently back in Texas on a sojourn there. So Rob is very happy to see the Minerva Astralis spectrograph do its thing. And Duncan Wright, uh, bottom left, in fact, oh, use the pointer. There's Duncan. Duncan Wright is originally from New Zealand. Um, Duncan is working with us on Minerva Astralis. He's our instrumentation guru. And Jake Clark um, is literally in Texas, in Austin right now. 
Jake is an is an Aussie, um, and he's doing finishing up his PhD, and he's got a, a Fulbright scholarship. So he's working with Natalie Hinkle um, in in Austin and doing all sorts of great work, and is um, very successful. So some happy um, astronomers working at Mount Kent with strong US connections. I'm pleased to say. Um, so, uh, so for the technically minded, yes, there are five um, telescopes and a Kiwi star spectrograph built in New Zealand, hence the name Kiwi, the flightless bird there, um, and telescopes that op operate independently as an array or feed the light into the spectrograph to increase the signal to noise. So it's a bench mounted shell spectrograph. And um, yes, we seem to be still Australia's most precise radial velocity spectrograph. Uh, we are still ahead of Veloce in terms of precision. Um, we also have capacity to do photometry, uh, which is handy if you want to do transit work, for example, or star spot monitoring, that sort of thing. Uh, there's Duncan silhouetted against the darkling sky. Um, we can do spectroscopy and photometry, and we hope over time to keep going with both types of observations. So radio velocity work is about finding and characterizing planets, photometry, is transit work, and um, if you time the exoplanet transit and it starts to evolve, there is a hint then that you've actually got other planets gravitating in the system that are tweaking the transit time. So photometry and spectroscopy both incredibly useful, and that's why we both try to do them in an ongoing way at Mount Kent. In terms of results, um, this is one example spectrum um, type plot where you've got the radial velocity of the star towards and away from you. So over time, the star will go uh, towards and away from you as indicated by that curve. And that implies being the reflex motion that there is a planet there, right? So there's a bunch of early discoveries on that slide, but the most recent one um, I haven't actually put into the slide yet because the press release was, I think, yesterday. But uh, the, the system is finding new worlds, I'm pleased to say. So, okay, to wrap up pretty much on the Nerva Australis, uh, it can confirm and study exoplanets for tests. Um, it can be used crucially to characterize mass density and orbit uh, and help us with uh, look for multi-planet systems, including the longer period worlds, because essentially because it's our own facility, we can just keep using it many years into the future, we hope. Um, so although the early discoveries, um, observational selection gets you the sort of the strange planets like the hot Jupiters, um, over time we have to have a more complete census of exoplanetary systems out there. And um, we are beginning to see, of course, um, more and more in a way of more solar system-like systems and more Earth-like worlds out there. Uh, briefly uh, mention the work of Song. So Song is operational. Um, it's a collaboration between Denmark and Australia, um, but others are all welcome to join. It's a, it's a, it's a really is a global enterprise, um, and it's all about doing seismology of stars, very subtle radial velocity measurements of the surface of the star, uh, telling you about what's happening. So it's very similar to what you do with Minerva Australis and doing reflex motion of stars. It really is the same technology but applied in a different way. And over time, what you start to see is velocity uh, plots that suggest um, a, a, a motion of the surface that can be used to infer what acoustic waves and structure is happening inside of the star. Um, the Galar work. Um, so yes, the sort of the, the running joke here is the Galar in Australia is not just a bird, but it's also a term to describe someone who's a bit of a fool, right? So, you know, if someone calls you a Galar, um, you might have to might have to be a bit worried about that. So anyway, um, so galactic archaeology with the Hermes spectrograph or Galar is a comprehensive snapshot of the Milky Way stars. It complements the uh, ESA's uh, Gaia astrometry mission, doing complementary information. So uh, that's all. Lots of papers coming out from from Galar, but USQ's role has been to help with dynamical modelling when it comes to exoplanetary work. Um, that uses Galar data, and we're also using Galar spectra of stars to imply, given we know what the star's made of, to infer what the planets might be made of. And this is a plot by Jake Clark, um, who you saw a photo of recently. Um, this is essentially a modeling of a planet. So radius and mass, two very simple quantities. 
If you can get them precise enough, though, you can start to determine if you model the terrestrial world, you can get an idea from the mass and radius as to whether it's actually Earth-like or something quite different. So while mass and radius are simple quantities, especially in a geophysics context, right? But it's a start. Once you get it precise enough, you start to get some idea of what the planet is made of if it's a terrestrial. Yeah, moving right along. Be cool, the stellar magnetic field study. Um, it's a 14 nation collaboration these days, started with the French Australian um, project and it's expanded. It's all about doing spectropolarimetry, stellar spectra and polarized light that can give you magnetic field information. So we can, oh, that's right. I do actually have a movie though. I'm not sure I can actually run it today. This is just a mini movie. I think I might pass on. Um, so um, what you can do with Zeeman Doppler imaging is um, essentially use tomography of and the spectrum of the star taken as it rotates and as it rotates you get a series of of um, slices if you like that can be combined tomographically to make maps so this is actually a map not of the star spots which is relatively straightforward but maps of the magnetic fields okay as the methyl radial and radial components of the magnetic field a lot of the data we use comes from um, uh, Pictomidia in France or um, the um, Espadon's instrument on the CFHT in Hawaii. We have done work in Australia. We'd love to do more work in this area with our American friends and colleagues. Um, something we can talk about with some of you next year. Um, one of the things you can do with the magnetic maps is not only get an idea of what the dynamo underneath it is that's producing it, but the radial field maps can be combined with, with solar space weather modeling software called BATSARAS, the space weather modeling framework code, MHD code, magnetohydrodynamic code. Use the magnetic field map that you can get with the MHD code. You can actually model um, stellar wind. So this is not a picture of spiral galaxies, okay? Just to put this out there. This is actually a top-down view of um, uh, stellar winds emerging from a star, a young sun-like star. Our um, PhD student, Doug, Doug Evensberger, who's from Norway, has done these wonderful um, models here showing the the winds emanating from this active young active young stars in, um, and the spiral type uh, structure that emerges um, from the rotating star. So, so beautiful work Doug's doing that highlights the fact you can now take space weather studies in the solar system and turn it into a, a grand field of understanding space weather um, and its impact on planetary systems. Okay, Veloce spectrograph at sighting spring, uh, radial velocity spectrograph, um, sighting spring, star trails, telescope, um, an early mock-up of the instrument. It doesn't look nearly as neat as that in reality, but it's a, it's a, it's a fairly st standard-looking shell spectrograph, uh, though it does have a lot of fibre feeds that tries to accommodate sighting springs less than perfect um, seeing. Um, it's a partnership of a bunch of universities, including USQ, and because the AAT has four metre rapid share, you can study fainter stars and do complementary work to the work of Ms. Minerva Astralis. Uh, but wait, there's more. Um, Veloce Raptor. So yes, a cute name, I understand. Nothing to do with dinosaurs, really. Um, but Raptor is an auxiliary telescope we will be putting um, next to the big AAT. It'll be... 0.8 meter telescope feeding light by a fiber to Veloce. So when the main telescope, AAT, is pointing elsewhere doing cosmology or something, we can feed light from Veloce Raptor telescope into the Veloce spectrograph using fiber. And uh, yeah, that uh, that telescope and the project should come to fruition um, sometime next year. Finally, really, almost finally, um, in terms of the key projects at least, um, we are Australia and USQ is now part of the UK-led international Twinkle space mission. And at least part of what it's going to do is spectroscopy of exoplanetary worlds. So there's a sort of mock-up of what it should be doing, Hubble versus Twinkle spectroscopy of exoplanets. Um, it's a relatively small telescope. It, it's nowhere near as ambitious as the James Webb, James Webb Space Telescope but has a certain niche in its ability to do 
optical and infrared spectroscopy of planetary systems. And uh, so we will be doing a survey um, and uh, we are working closely with the folks at Blue Sky Space, uh, University College London and others um, to uh, make Twinkle a reality, launching 2024. So something for the future with our little mock up there of, this, of the telescope floating above Mount Kent there somewhere down there. So that's that's for the future. A um, couple of final comments before I wrap up about the future of exoplanetary science. Um, TESS, of course, is finding many planets, including Earth-like worlds and potentially quite a few habitable zone worlds. So all part of the grand theme of the search for, for uh, other Earths. Um, and um, it's a grand challenge occupying a number of telescopes, a, tw a Twinkle Space Mission, James Webb, the Plato or Plato, depending on who you are, space mission, uh, and Ariel, which is a European mission, which will be a bigger, grander one than, than Twinkle. Uh, all of these telescopes will find good use um, in, the, in the quest for finding and characterizing habitable uh, planets. And of course, for the nearby worlds, um, we might even go and launch a spacecraft um, in the lifetimes of some, some folks in the audience. Um, so here's one concept, this, the Breakthrough star drop, a very starshot starship, you know, a sort of a very small, um, uh, tiny um, spacecraft. You know, we're talking about sort of gram scale spacecraft and uh, gigantic light sail um, to accelerate the spacecraft to uh, huge speed. So within a human life or lifetime or so, a flyby of some of the nearer planets like the planet around Proxima Centauri. So exciting stuff for the future. Um, of course, um, stars, as I mentioned previously, stars and planets evolve together. So we, I think we very much need to focus on both stars and planets as common systems, because if you want to understand planetary habitability, it really is as much about the host star as it is about the planet itself. We know planet Earth has a rather long natural window, fortunately for all of us. Um, we need to, when we're searching for habitable worlds, understand the heart star and its activity. Um, but I think ultimately we can be optimistic if we're looking for life elsewhere, because there's a gigantic number of potentially habitable worlds out there. Okay, We haven't found many of them yet, but they are, well, I think we can be fairly confident in predicting they should be out there somewhere. And as we know from life on Earth, it is incredibly hardy. And some of you would know the story of the, the microbes that that were somehow contaminated the surveyor uh, eight, um, camera spacecraft to the moon and the Apollo astronauts brought, brought the camera back and discovered there were viable bugs that had survived several years on the lunar surface. So if, if life on Earth can be so hardy, I'm, I'm fairly confident that given the commonplace nature of uh, atoms that make life, that we should see many out there. <laughs> Uh, okay, expecting intelligent civilizations is a tough call. Some would argue we haven't found intelligent civilizations on Earth yet, but I'll leave that issue to another day and at this point wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank you much. much. Uh, that was very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, so, so we are all looking yeah. forward to the press release and uh, seeing many more new exoplanets. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Uh, anyone? The floor is open. Or comments? Um, while we are waiting for comments from the audience, perhaps I could ask, uh, does, does this model that you use to predict uh, the radius versus mass, for example, mm -hmm. does it take into account that uh, there could be about 25% uh, uh, of dark matter and 70% of dark energy in the model of the universe? Sadly, no. Um, I think um, the model, if I understand it, is very much um, based on uh, geophysics and solar system physics. So if you like, fairly conventional um, work that is done to understand the bulk properties of terrestrial planets in the solar system is then extrapolated, if you like, um, using almost no data. Let's face it, mass and radius is, is not much, but it's, it's, 
it really is um, limited to, um, if you like, um, classical physics and um, um, very conventional approaches to uh, planetary um, interior modeling. Hmm. So it, we still it, have it, a way of uh, improving the modeling, I guess. Well, exactly, uh, indeed. We, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure amongst the many things that need to be done with that model, we need to look more broadly at these other issues, as you mentioned. Okay, I, I see there's a comment uh, here. Perhaps you can read it. This is from Professor uh, I, I don't actually see any comments. I'm afraid you might have to read it out to me. Ah, okay. Uh, so he's asking, have you considered exchanging Fulbright scholars, either students or faculty? Uh, yes, we'd love to. Um, I I would argue that it's one of the topics that we can talk about when I'm there um, next springtime because um, we would love to see much more in the way of exchange between USQ and Louisville and people in Kentucky generally. Um, we have a very solid um, astronomical collaboration and I think there are many opportunities for further exchanges, particularly when it comes to graduate students. We would love to see um, uh, graduate students from Kentucky spend some time in Australia and uh, some time at the observatory, some time at the beach would be perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm sure people would like that. <laughs> uh, application deadlines in the US are around 12th October, one just passed, but ah. one in Australia may be different. Yeah, yeah, there are various deadlines. Um, um, yeah, I think I think the advice I would give in terms of Fulbright is to start nice and early. Um, so maybe it's a reminder to start thinking about applying for next year, a year from now. Um, I, I would argue that uh, Fulbright um, requires really some months of uh, preparation uh, to be meeting the deadline, but I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about um, uh, future exchanges. And um, as long as we have more than a few days before the deadline, we, sh we can give it a shot. I'm sure if it's interest, the students will take note. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the audience? Looks like people are very thrilled in digesting your presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. And it's also I appreciate we've we've reached the nominal end of the hour, so and people might have other things to do. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions on the topic. I can even talk about uh, Mount Kent and Australia generally for those who are curious. So I'm I'm open to questions. Very nice talk. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure people will write to you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank Take you. care. Take care. Thanks one again, all. and let's thank the speaker and all the people for joining. So, I guess that's the end of the meeting. And thank you for inviting me to to spend some time in a virtual sense um, at your colloquium. So, have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.